Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Daniel Canstrom, and as the faculty director of the Rappaport Center at Boston College Law School, it's my great pleasure to welcome you together with our executive director, Lissy Medvedow, and our assistant, Cindy Wynn, to welcome you all to this lecture and conversation on a most timely and most important topic, defunding versus reforming the police, varying approaches to addressing police misconduct in the 21st century. <clears throat> our speaker today, Ajmel Qureshi, is one of two senior fellows who will join us at the Rappaport Center this year. The idea of this senior fellows program was to enhance our other programming, which as I hope many of you, if not all of you know, focuses on important issues of law and public policy, offers a wonderful fellowship program over the summer, hosts many conferences and symposia, and also invites a distinguished professor to BC for a semester, a cohort that has included Richard Cordray, the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and Ohio's former attorney general, former governors Jane Swift, Daniel Malloy, and Martin O'Malley, and former SJC justices Robert Cordy and Geraldine Hines, and former US attorney Carmen Ortiz. The essential idea behind the Senior Fellows Program was to seek a diverse cohort of exciting, successful mid-career professionals, including academics, practitioners, and activists who work on cutting edge issues of law and public policy. We invite them to come here for a very intense, but rather brief visit in which we hope to learn from them and hope that they would get to know us, especially our students with whom we hope they will work and develop future professional relationships and perhaps research projects. So I also wanna particularly welcome our summer fellows and students in our new seminar on law and public policy, which is connected to this program. These students are also all engaged now in exciting research and advocacy on a wide range of important topics. Now, one technical note, uh, first, this program is being recorded. Um, and second, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function and not your voice to ask questions uh, after the lecture is completed, we should have some a good amount of time for Q&A. So feel free to write your questions um, at any time and they'll be saved in the Q&A function. Um, now to introduce our senior fellow to you, it is my great pleasure to turn things over to one of our wonderful students who was a Rappaport fellow this past summer, Vanessa Lawrence. Vanessa is a second year law student at Boston College Law School. She graduated from Colgate University in 2019, majoring in sociology with a minor in educational studies, cum laude. While there, she discovered a passion for studying the intersections of race, socioeconomic status, gender, and education through qualitative and quantitative research. This past summer, Vanessa worked as a legal intern at the Massachusetts Attorney General's program as a Rapport Fellow where she was particularly interested in the effects of institutionalized oppression on the local community and ways to make the voices of oppressed people heard in the legal profession. So, as I say, it's my great pleasure to turn over to Vanessa and um, she will then introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Vanessa. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Canstrom, for those words of welcome. In recent months, National conversations have been sparked by the continuation of state-sanctioned violence against Black and Brown communities. This violence is nothing new to our communities, and yet this time feels different. Maybe it's because COVID has shut down the world and forced us to take a serious look at the injustices in our country and the widening disparities between haves and have-nots. Either way, change has continued to be the topic of conversation. As we locate power within these institutions, it is also important to recognize and build power within our communities. Organizations like the NAACP have long standing importance in the black community and wield a special kind of power. Today's talk is particularly relevant because it speaks to various approaches to police reform. Oftentimes we have an essentializing narrative in which all communities share the exact same goal. Rather, the reality is that to be responsive to our communities and to hold a damning institution accountable, we must approach the problem from all sides. Today, we have the great honor of attending Mr. Qureshi's presentation. 
Ajmel Qureshi serves as senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, LDF. In that role, Qureshi maintains a diverse caseload spearheading LDF's work in areas of education and economic justice, among others. In 2019, Qureshi led LDF's efforts in Bradford v. Maryland State Board of Education, a case on behalf of a class of school children in Baltimore who had been denied constitutionally adequate education. In 2018, Qureshi served as lead counsel for LDF in multiple suits challenging the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development suspension of housing regulations that would have made housing more accessible and affordable. Beyond his work at LDF, Qureshi serves as director of the Civil Rights Clinic at Howard University School of Law, where he has also taught courses in torts, federal civil rights, and appellate litigation. Under his direction, the clinic has filed amicus briefs in several cases before the United States Supreme Court. In 2018, the clinic filed a lawsuit challenging the Trump administration's termination of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, mm -hmm. DACA program. His teaching has been recognized by Harvard Law School, which awarded him in 2016 a Vassar Stein Fellowship. Qureshi's editorial writings have appeared in the Baltimore Sun and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He has published articles in several legal journals on topics ranging from international environmental law to the capability of Islam and democracy, excuse me, to the compatibility of Islam and democracy. And his cases have been featured by the New York Times and the Daily Show with Jon Stewart, among others. It is with great pleasure and excitement that I welcome you, Mr. Qureshi, to BC Law, and I look forward to engaging with your work. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lawrence, for that incredibly kind and, and generous introduction. And thank you to Professor Canstrom, the Rappaport Center, and all of you for taking the time to, to talk today and, and listen to me talk. You know, it's it's a little bit tough. You know, I'm, I'm a, on and off for the last 10 years. I've taught at Howard Law School, and um, I, I, I believe in the Socratic method in part, not sort of the paper chase version of the Socratic method where, you know, I ask questions and try to terrify my students. For those of you who've seen paper chase or have some familiarity with it, I'm more, I'm more, I mean it more in the sense that I'd like to be able to engage with all of you in person, to be able to uh, read your faces, to see how you're responding to what I'm saying, and then to be able to have an interactive uh, discussion where I learn a little bit from you and hopefully you'd learn a tiny bit from me, but we can't do that today. And so unfortunately uh, I'm gonna lecture, hopefully it won't be too dry and too boring, but I hope that we'll all be able to get something out of it. And I'll try to leave a substantial portion of time at the end for questions and discussion. And, and, and I should be clear, I mean, this is a divisive concept that many people have different views about. And I'm going to try to cover it was a very broad uh, issue from a variety of different perspectives, but by no means do I think that the perspective that I'm presenting today is the only perspective. I think it's one that's well reasoned and worth considering, but certainly look forward to your feedback, your thoughts and your comments when I'm done. Um, so with all that said, I think it would be helpful, uh, you know, because I'm doing this online and virtually I've put together some PowerPoint slides, nothing particularly dynamic or exciting, um, no crazy designs or pictures, unfortunately, but just uh, it'll go over some of the main points that I want to discover. And if you get bored with my voice, um, you can stare at the screen and hopefully pick up a few things of what I'm saying. So with all that said, I think, uh, uh, Ms. Nguyen, if you could pull up the PowerPoint slides, that would be great. Great. So we've sort of got the title here on the first page, which I know all of you, uh, all of you know, and, um, you know, let's move to the next slide. All right. So I always think it's important to begin any conversation with the first principles. What are we trying to accomplish and what do we generally agree about? So, you know, I always, before I write any sort of talk or even before I begin a brief, 
I usually uh, go down to my workspace in my home, which is uh, you know in, in one particular corner with a lamp. I, I get some sort of cold beverage and I, I do most of my writing and thinking late at night after everyone else is asleep. Uh, a couple of you have already heard me talk about uh, my eight-year-old who manages and runs over my house throughout most of the day. You know, at, long after he's asleep, I usually do most, most of my writing. And I always think it's a good thing to think about first principles first. And what do we all agree on before we get into what we most gen what we don't agree about? So I, I think it seems fair to say that most of us agree or recognize that people should be safe in and outside their homes from any sort of violence. Uh, it seems like a fairly basic principle. Uh, but as Ms. Lawrence pointed out, this includes uh, not only individuals who fear violence from non-state actors, but individuals who fear violence from state actors as well, whether it be the police or military. So all of us generally, I think, agree that people have the right to be safe in their homes and safe in public from all sorts of violence. Okay, that's principle number one. Principle number two, all or most of us recognize that despite the fact that we think that everyone should be safe in their home, there is some degree of unnecessary police violence, whether in people's homes or in the public. And that unnecessary violence, though we may disagree about how much unnecessary violence there is, is bad for everyone. It's bad legally, it's bad morally, and it makes all of us less safe. It's obviously harmful for the people affected, but it also creates a general sense of distrust between the public and state actors, whether police or over otherwise. And it's no secret, as Justice Sotomayor has stated in her opinions, that people of color are disproportionate victims of police scrutiny. This includes the actual deaths of a number of black and brown individuals. Uh, some basic stats compiled by the US government. African Americans make up 13% of the US population, but account for 24% of people fatally shot by the police. Black individuals are two and a half times as likely as white Americans to be shot and killed by police officers. Unfortunately, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this today, this is a historical problem. According to the Illinois Association for Criminal Justice, according to a study they conducted between 1927 and 1928, although African-Americans made up just 5% of the area's population, this is looking at Chicago and Cook County, they constituted 30% of the victims of police killing. So as Professor Canstrom said, the problem that we're talking about now, although it's gotten additional scrutiny, I think, due to a combination of factors which we can talk about, is an, is an, is an old problem. It's not particularly new, and, and that makes it particularly troublesome that despite the fact that we've known about this problem for, for centuries, really, um, it continues to remain a problem in society today. We know the names of the individuals who've been killed in instances of excessive use of police force. Walter Scott shot in the back as he ran from police. LeVar Jones shot in his car while reaching for his wallet. The death of George Floyd, police kneeled on his neck after police were called to a scene where he allegedly used a counterfeit bill. Eric Garner choked to death using an illegal chokehold. Um, for those of you who are a little bit older, you probably remember Amadou Diallo, shot at 41 times, hit 19 times as he reached in to grab his wallet from his, from his chest pocket. And the police violence, let's be clear, isn't limited to just actual deaths. It includes the disproportionate stop, frisk, and arrest of Black individuals. I think too often when we think about police violence, we limit it, we limit it to the excessive use of force. But I think being stopped and searched and accosted by an, by an officer of the state without cause should count as violence as well. I do a lot of work in Baltimore, as has been mentioned already. I have a big school funding case there. So I picked up some stats from the Baltimore Police Department. According to the US Department of Justice, Baltimore police officers recorded over 300,000 
pedestrian stops between January of 2010 and May of 2015. These stops were concentrated in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Only 3.7% of pedestrian stops resulted in officers actually making a citation or an arrest. So that's for every 100 stops that actually occurred in predominantly African-American neighborhoods, less than four of those 100 actually led to a citation or an arrest. BPD made roughly 44% of its stops in two small, predominantly African-American districts that contain only 11% of the city's populations. Seven African-American men during this period were stopped more than 30 times each. Uh, the, the violence isn't limited just to stop and frisks in, in sort of the on the street context. It also extends to the traffic context as well. Every year, police st officials stop more than 20 million individuals every year. After controlling for factors such as age, stop time, and location, researchers have consistently found that African Americans are stopped by police at a higher rate than their white and Hispanic counterparts. So we'll go to Baltimore again. African Americans accounted for 82% of all BPD vehicle stops, compared to only 60% of the driving age population and 27% of, compared to only 27% uh, of uh, the driving age population in the greater metropolitan area. Perhaps the most dramatic example of the disparate treatment of black individuals came on January 6th, when scores of predominantly white protesters stormed the Capitol encouraged by the president at that time. The stark contrast in the manner in which they were treated as opposed to black protesters in Louisville, for example, who, uh, who were met with flashbang, pepper balls, and tear gas shows some of the examples of the disparity in which black and white protesters are treated. Um, next slide, please. Uh, my third point on uh, what we should, what we, the, our starting points or first principles or things we generally all or most of us agree on is that there are some, although we may disagree how much, some police officers who act based on what's leg what legally would be called discriminatory intent, but not all officers act on the basis of discriminatory intent. So I've included a couple of key slides, a couple of key quotes that I pulled out from some amicus briefs that I've done in the past where officers have admitted to acting based on dis discriminatory intent or what sounds like to me discriminatory intent. We have a lieutenant from the Maryland State Police saying that stopping blacks at a disproportionate rate is a byproduct of sound policing. We have a quote as well from the former superintendent of the New Jersey State Police, Carl Williams, who stated that most likely it's a minority group that's involved in narcotics, thus justifying disparities in stops. Uh, switch slides, please. So now that we've covered some basic facts about what we agree on, again, we may not agree about how much unnecessary police violence is. We may not agree about how many police officers bake, uh, act based on discriminatory intent, but I think all of us generally agree on these three principles. Number one, people should be allowed to be safe in their homes and in public. Number two, there is some degree of unnecessary police violence. And number three, there are some officers, but not all officers who act on the basis of discriminatory intent. So that's those are the basic facts about what we agree upon um, and where we stand as a society. But I also think it's really important to ask how we got here the history, because the history impacts how communities view policing. We can't have this conversation without recognizing that communities' views and reactions to police do not exist in a vacuum, but are influenced by history. So I've, I'm going to do a brief section now where we talk a little bit about the history of policing and how it relates to police violence today. The first police force was created in the city of Boston in 1830. It's generally recognized as the first because it was the first municipal police force to be publicly funded and supported. And by the 1890s, every major city had a police force. Switch slides, slides please. 
But this doesn't mean that cities didn't have police forces or the equivalent of police forces before that. For example, the Charleston City Watch and Guard was formed in the 1790s. It was created primarily to control the movement of enslaved Africans at, who had been brought to the United States by force. In the city of Charleston, as we know, the majority of the people living there at the time were, were black individuals. So the minority white population was extremely worried, essentially terrified about the possibility of slave uprisings. So they wanted to make sure that there was some sort of group ready to control to make sure that people were being closely monitored, especially when they were working outside or of the purview or control of the individual enslaving them. These forces were called on to enforce what are commonly known now as slave codes. Uh, some examples of slave co co codes essentially provided that no master or overseer shall allow a slave of another to remain on his plantation for more than four hours. And these slave co co codes were very explicit in their reasoning. They were created specifically because Black Americans were seen as, quote unquote, in, in the words of the the legislators behind them, inherently criminal and dangerous. Thus, black individuals were not trusted to give evidence in court. Virginia's slave codes in particular served as a model for similar enactments by other states throughout the early country. These laws, as well as the assumptions on which they were built were critical to American slavery in several regards. First, the first, the racist and false myth of Blacks' inherent criminal propensity was key to dehumanizing the enslaved individuals over whom brutal control was both needed and justified in the words of the individuals who passed the slave codes. These slave codes were, and it's important to note, these slave codes were applied to African Americans in the United States regardless of whether or not they were free or enslaved. Switch slides, please. Unfortunately, with the end of uh, slavery after the Civil War, this wasn't the end of discriminatory policies that controlled the movement of African Americans. As we move past the period of slavery and we get into the period of Reconstruction and even the period of J Jim Crow, what we see is the creation of groups whose job now isn't to control individuals who are enslaved, but to control African Americans who were previously enslaved. And what we see is that these groups called on to enforce now what are called black co codes function much like the actual slave patrols that existed beforehand. And again, and the policies were similarly meant to control the lives and movements of black individuals. For example, immediately following the end of the Civil War, many of the provisional legislatures passed black codes, which limited the rights of African Americans to own or rent property and permitted imprisonment for breach of employment contracts. These laws came up in several Supreme Court cases. Many of you are probably aware of Plessy v. Ferguson, for example, in which an African American man challenged his arrest for violating one of these codes by sitting in the coach of a passenger train reserved for white passengers. The African American plaintiff argued that the black code at issue violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The Supreme Court, as you know, rejected this argument. We, of course, all remember Plessy and think about the Supreme Court's ruling and how it was wrong. But how often do we think about the fact that the case arose out of the arrest by a police officer of a black man, or that there were police officers all over the country who enforced such codes on a daily basis across the country, or that the court justified the necessity of such laws as a means to preserve public safety? The ordinance specifically stated that it was passed to preserve peace and promote the general welfare through the separation of the races. Plessy wasn't the only law to come before the court in this form. In Hardin v. City of Atlanta, an African-American man challenged an Atlanta ordinance which prohibited African-Americans from residing in a block where the majority of residents were white. Again, we forget that police were responsible for enforcing this ordinance. The court rejected the challenge, reasoning that segregation is not imposed as a stigma and the law was necessary to, quote, uphold the integrity of each race and to prevent conflicts between them resulting from close association.
a similar law came before the court in Buchanan v. Warley. And again, the ordinance stated that its purpose was to prevent conflict and ill feeling between the white and colored races. This is, of course, not to mention the role that police played in response to the civil rights movement. Aggressive dispersion tactics such as police dogs and fire hoses against individuals in peaceful protests and sit-ins were the most widely publicized examples of police brutality in the era. Next slide, please. So now we've talked a little bit about what I think we all generally agree about. We've talked a little bit about the history. And again, I think the history is really important because it shapes a community's understanding of what the role of state actors is. But it's also important to recognize once we've gotten past the history that police violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's important to explore the larger social context within which police violence occurs. We've already covered this somewhat by discussing the problematic policies that police are sometimes called on to enforce. But it's not just the laws that police are called on to enforce. It's the larger social structures within which police function, for example, segregation and poverty. In 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson organized the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders to investigate the causes of major riots uh, or major social unrest uh, after police killings. The commission concluded that police actions were the final incidents before the outbreak of unrest in 12 of the 24 major protests surveyed. The commission specifically identified segregation and poverty as indicators that unrest was about to occur and published recommendations for reducing social inequalities. For example, directly assisting low-income households to obtain adequate housing. Johnson, however, rejected the commission's recommendations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is not to mention the large scale in addition to segregation and poverty, this doesn't even account for the large scale underfunding of mental health services over the last half century. Approximately 2.2 million people with severe mental illnesses do not receive treatment in the United States. As a result of public hospital closures during the 1980s, our country has fewer than 150,000 beds for patients with serious mental illnesses. Left with no other place to go and no viable option for treatment, the reality for many of these individuals is that when they commit crimes, influenced by mental illness, they are arrested and incarcerated. The lack of a public mental health system means that prisons and jails often function as de facto treatment centers. Just one example, Chicago's Cook County Jail is actually the largest provider of mental health services in the entire United States. Altogether, approximately 36.6% .6 of prison prisoners and 43.7% of persons in jail report having been diagnosed by a mental profession, health professional with a depressive disorder, schizophrenia, or another psychotic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or anxiety. Next slide, please. So now we've covered what all of the challenges are, both in terms of the current situation, as well as the history, as well as the social context. So now that we've covered what some of the challenges are, it's important to think about what can we actually do about it. But those ch the challenges are, are important because now that we understand what the scope of the problem actually is, we need a solution that actually addresses the scope of the problem, not just a piece of it. Let's look at some of the traditional approaches that have been that have been tried to that have tried to address police violence. One of the most common is getting more information about officers' backgrounds. One of the traditional approaches has been to increase available information regarding officers' disciplinary records, or what are commonly known as "quote unquote" personnel records. Traditionally, most public information laws, however, have exceptions for personnel records, and courts in many states have concluded that the officer's interest in privacy outweighs the public's interest in obtaining information about the officer's disciplinary history. Together with the lack of a uniform database for officers disciplined for misconduct, 
This, these have led to office. These have led to officers repeatedly moving from force to force and committing conduct at new police forces when they have a record of engaging in bad acts at other police forces at which they were at beforehand. The lack of a database or the release of such records played a role in the death of Terrence Crutcher, who was shot by Better, Betty Jo Shelby. Uh, Crut Crutcher was, un as you probably recall, Crutcher was unarmed standing in the street. Uh, the officer, Betty Jo Shelby, had been accused of excessive force in her career twice previously and had been accused of domestic violence in two separate occasions. Most recently, New York moved to make officers' disciplinary records public. So that's one of the traditional approaches that has been tried. Another traditional approach has been tried that, that has been tried or should be tried is a moratorium on the use of certain types of force. As we saw in the case of the death of Eric Garner, police often respond with unnecessary force, sometimes in the type of force that they're using. This has particularly been the case in some jurisdictions in response to Black Lives Matter protests over the last year. LDF has a fairly prominent case in Louisville where we, along with the Kentucky American Civil Liberties Union and the law firm of Emory Chelley, filed a complaint against the city of Louisville, Kentucky, for the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department's use of military force repeatedly and intimidation in response to peaceful protesters. Those protests remain ongoing to this day, and we allege in the case that LMPD has repeatedly responded to peaceful demonstrations with violence. Throughout late May and June, the LMPD used tear gas, flashbangs, pepper bottles, batons, and other military grade technology on peaceful protesters. Other similar cases have been brought in various other jurisdictions, including Detroit, Denver, Portland, and Washington, DC. Other legislative efforts at reform have included ending or seeking to end qualified immunity. This is a defense that shields officers from being sued and has been interpreted by courts so broadly that it allows officers to engage in unconstitutional acts, often with virtual impunity. Changing the statutory state of mind required to violate the federal criminal rights statute from willful to reckless, so making it easier to seek criminal charges for the violation of, a, of the federal criminal civil rights statute, adopting a federal standard that requires use of force to be used only when necessary as a last resort after exhausting reasonable options, and prohibiting racial profiling and requiring data collection on police community encounters. And then I have one more that's not included in the slide, which we've sought through advocacy efforts to obtain Louisville prohibiting the use of no-knock warrants, especially for drug searches. Next slide, please. But is it enough to just reform? <clears throat> Traditionally, settlement decrees in policing cases, for example, have called for increased training on bias. However, a 2017 meta-analysis of 492 studies found that reducing implicit bias did not actually alter individuals' behavior. In 2016, the Harvard Business Review explored diversity programs and anti-bias trainings and concluded that while people are easily taught to respond correctly to a questionnaire about bias, they soon forget the right answers. And so I think all of us, or maybe many of us, have had the feeling of sitting through a bias or a diversity training and you know what you're supposed to say in response to the questions and you answer them because you think that's the right answer that you're supposed to give but do going through that process of sitting through a powerpoint slide and then answering questions the way you know that you're supposed to answer them does that actually change your actual behavior Lorenzo Boyd, the director of the Center for Advanced Policing at the University of New Haven, has said that implicit bias training is not top of mind when officers respond to alleged threats because their reactions stem from what's called warrior training. Police self-identify as warriors, he has said. The thinking is we've got to find the bad guy, we've got to fight evil, as opposed to we're supposed to serve the community and we're supposed to help people. They've tasked themselves with prioritizing law enforcement, Boyd has said, even though that's only one part of their job. And again, as we talked about earlier, um, police are called on to do this wide range of activity that's more than just uh, responding to criminal incidents. They're called on to deal with 
with mental health problems. They're called, they're often placed in school as school resource officers. So they have to deal with behavioral problems uh, from students as well. All that said, there is some evidence that sometimes implicit bias training can work, but it must be done the right way. These are the two key pillars to whether or not bias training can be done properly. First, whether or not there's rigorous evaluation of the training. What are you, you have to measure individuals' actions in terms of what actions they took before the bias training was put into place. And then you have to measure the actions afterwards and see whether or not there actually was a change in behavior. And if there's not a change in behavior, then you have to ask yourself, why hasn't the training worked? And is there anything that can be done to make the training more effective? Second, in addition to measuring whether or not the training is effective, you actually have to examine the policies and procedures and enforcement practices in place. Bias often occurs when policies and procedures give too much discretion to the individual who's called on to act. When you're in a certain place in a certain time and you don't have specific guidance as, what you're, as to what you're supposed to do, and you have to make a decision in a split second or in a matter of minutes, people are going to fall back onto biases in those particular circumstances. So you have to review policies and procedures to make sure that they provide enough guidance, direct guidance, to to individuals. Jennifer Eberhardt, who's done some of this work, her team of Stanford researchers worked with a task force in the Oakland Police Department. She pushed officers to ask themselves a question before each and every stop they make. And that question was, is this stop actually led by concrete evidence? Adding that checkbox, according to Jennifer Eberhardt, made a huge difference. In 2017, Oakland officers made roughly 32,000 stops, but after implementing that question in 2018, officers made about 19,000 stops. African-American stops alone fell by over 43%. Next slide, please. But the truth is it hasn't always worked. Five years ago, the Minneapolis Police Department was under intense pressure in the wake of both the national crisis of police killings of unarmed Black men and its own local history of unnecessary police violence. In response, the department leaders undertook a series of reforms proposed by the Obama administration's Justice Department and procedural reform advocates in academia. In 2015, they brought in a procedural reformer and, and an implicit bias uh, trainer to lead a three-year $4.7 million project. So this is for almost $5 million in additional funding that was put into the police department to use data collection, social psychology, and police community dialogues to repair and strengthen the frayed relationship between cops and communities officers were trained in how to respond to mental health crisis calls, how to supposedly de-escalate confrontations with the public, how to supposedly be mindful in dangerous circumstances, and how to be more self-aware of their implicit racial biases. Nonetheless, the death of George Floyd, George Floyd occurred regardless. And I think that's one of the most troubling things about those who push uh, implicit bias training as a panacea of sorts is that this is exactly what was tried through a three-year five million dollar project in Minneapolis and yet the death of George Floyd still occurred. Accordingly, many are calling on Mayor Jacob Fry of, of Minneapolis to defund the police department by 45 million and shift those resources into community-led health and safety strategies. The Minneapolis Police Department currently uses up to 30% of the entire city budget. Uh, as, as, they, as some advocates have argued, instead of giving them more money for training programs that don't actually serve the purpose for which they're supposed to achieve, let's divert that money into building up communities and individuals so we don't need violent and abusive policing. So, why hasn't implicit bias training worked? Number one, it assumes that police enforce laws that themselves are neutral. 
It assumes that police are neutrally enforcing a set of laws that are automatically beneficial to everyone, instead of questioning the validity of using police to wage what I think many of us, many of us have recognized is a biased war on drugs. Number two, it assumes that police's work is limited to just criminal law enforcement. We've talked a little bit about this already. Rather, rather the reality is, is that too often we treat every social problem as one that needs to be turned over to the police. Uh, school police officers, for example, uh, even though mental health services have been decimated, let's send police to handle those as well. Um, as we've talked about already with the National Commission on, on Social Disorders, segregation and poverty are often the real problem, yet we call police to uh, over-enforce broken windows policing in precisely these neighborhoods. Third, relying on implicit bias training alone ignores the militarization, the often unnecessary militarization of police. Many of you are probably aware of the federal 1033 program. The Department of Justice's COPS office and Homeland Security grants have challenged, channeled billions of dollars in military hardware in, into American police departments all over the country. A whole generation of police officers have been given warrior training that teaches them to see every encounter with the police as potentially their last. Next slide. The alternative to relying just on reform efforts is to go beyond reform to something more. The alternative is to support a reimagination of public safety that drastically reduces the presence of and need for armed law enforcement in black and brown communities, that reduces the budgets of police departments and redirects those funds to underfunded agencies and community programs best equipped to address experiences or behaviors that are often inappropriately criminalized, such as homelessness, substance use, substance abuse, and behavioral health crises. We could remove police from schools and promote positive school climates through student support services. And we also could eliminate federal programs that provide military equipment to law enforcement. Now, while all of these things are being done, it doesn't mean that we can't take some reform efforts at the same time. And some of the reform efforts that LDF have, have called on are to negotiate police union contract provisions to ensure police officers are held accountable for misconduct promptly and appropriately. LD LDF has put together a toolkit that examines some of the most problematic portions in police union contracts. For example, delays in interviewing officers accused of misconduct, limits on time periods for imposing discipline on officers accused of misconduct, requirements that complaints be signed or sw sworn, which are often uh, an undue burden for individuals, removal of disciplinary records from police personnel files so individuals don't have access to them, the composition of disciplinary hearing boards, which often don't in involve members of the community, and the use of vacation or other leave time in lieu of suspension for officers uh, found guilty of misconduct. In some states, similar provisions are actually codified into law. Maryland, for example, has what's called a Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. One of its most problematic portions essentially provides that a series of days, seven days have to pass before an officer can be questioned about any sort of police shooting. What this essentially provides, although it's defended as a cooling off provision, what it actually provides is that officers are allowed to get together and get their stories straight as to what actually happened. Some jurisdictions have already begun to take some of the transformative action that we're talking about. For example, San Francisco announced plans to stop sending police officers to calls that don't involve actual criminal activity. So I've tried to provide a broad overview of the problem that we're facing, as well as some solutions to it. I, I think that one doesn't necessarily have to choose between uh, quote unquote defunding and reforming police departments. I think that we can take efforts which accomplish both, but uh, you, I, I think it's important to not limit ourselves to just saying the solution is increased implicit bias training, but also to look to other transformative solutions as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ajmal. I'm gonna jump in for a moment just to facilitate here. That, that was very, very informative. Excellent presentation. 
Um, we have a couple of questions, but one or two of them relate to the program itself. So I'm going to direct your attention to the question uh, that's uh, by Tom Palmer, which is related to what you're talking about today and, and invite others. We have about 15 minutes or so for questions. So if people have others, they can still post them in the Q&A function. Can you see Tom Palmer's question? I can. I haven't read the piece that he's describing, so I, I can't <laughs> respond to it. But if, okay. if Tom is able to put in sort of the thesis, I'm happy to give my thoughts on it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see if we have any other questions coming our way. I think we're having a little bit of a glitch with the Q&A function, but um, I'm particularly going to invite students in the seminar to um, to weigh in if they'd like to here. As I say, we don't, we don't have a lot of time, but we have a few minutes. Actually, uh, while we're waiting for other questions, maybe I'll just pose one to you. Um, you know, we had talked a bit in, in earlier conversations about um, the complexity of the um, relationship between legal strategies and public policy strategies. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, about where you think the best ideas are coming from or what you think is the, the sort of optimal level. I mean, another, another variant of this question would be to think about the federal versus state versus city. You know, advocacy tends to start at a local level, but it's, it's, it's supported by national organizations. There are often conflicts there. Um, and I see Tom Palmer has posted the thing, but I don't think it, you're gonna have time to read it now and respond to it. So maybe you could talk a little bit about my question. Then somebody asked, what brings you the most hope moving forward, which is a wonderful question. <laughs> So I think that what brings me the most hope is the renewed attention to this issue. I think that's why I really started with <clears throat> the list of individuals who've been victims of police violence. You know, it's you know I think everyone, at least of, of this generation, knows about George Floyd and Eric Garner and, and Michael Brown. But for those of us who are who've, who've sort of been looking at this issue for a little bit longer, I mean, Amadou Diallo, you know, in 2000 was was Eric Garner and Michael Brown before Eric Garner and Michael Brown and it's sad that it's been 20 years and we're still having the same conversation that we were having back then. I think that the increased attention from social media has brought to life or at least brought more attention to the issue in a way that it wasn't before because we didn't have these actual videos which are so dramatic and so gruesome to watch and I didn't include any videos in my presentation because I'm sure many of you have probably seen them already and didn't need to be traumatized by seeing them again but I think that what brings me hope is that a lot of new people who weren't attuned to this issue or attuned to it now because of social media I think the key is that we actually have to build upon that new engagement and actually transform it into policy change and listen to not only you know folks at LDF obviously but folks on the ground in each of your communities i think in addition to working at LDF you know i, I live in Tacoma Park Maryland which is just outside of DC i'm on my Tacoma Park um, reimagining public safety task force because uh, we have to sort of work on all of these issues in the individual communities that we live. And that's probably where we can make this the most transformative change. Also, that happens to be one of the first communities and still only communities to allow voting rights for non-citizens, as I recall. In local elections, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the other questions? There's a few of them now in the Q&A and there's one in the chat, um, but maybe you go through the ones in the Q&A first, if you can see them. So one of the questions is about broader decriminalization of narcotics and lowering the drinking age. So a couple of thoughts on that. First, I think that, and I tried to make this clear in my talk, and I think this is a great question, is that you know often it's not just what police themselves do, it's what police are called on to do 
by legislatures and other lawmaking bodies that create laws and call on police to enforce things that they never should be enforcing in the first place. I think the challenge, I think most people generally support decriminalization in, in the civil rights community. I think the real questions and the real frustrating parts for many people about decriminalization is that you have large numbers of black and brown individuals behind bars who quote unquote committed crimes, many of them nonviolent um, before decriminalization occurred. And now you have you know, millions of dollars going to new dispensaries and dispenser corporations that have been created, most of which are white owned while black and brown individuals uh, remain in jail for distribution uh, related offenses. And so I think that decriminalization is a positive thing, but I think beyond, I, I'll sort of push it back on the questioner. And I think it's, again, it's a great question. Uh, yes, let's do decriminalization, but also let's go beyond that to some sort of recompense for those who wouldn't have been in jail had the law been as such beforehand. All right, uh, question from Ms. Uh, Sokolowski. How do you think about addressing problematic policing in smaller towns where police killings are more rare? In my small town, I've had a terrible, I've had trouble communicating the urgency of this problem because it can be difficult to point to concrete instances of police racism and much of the data on police behavior is difficult to uncover. So I, I think there is, I mean, I, I don't know your small town and so that's, uh, I'm gonna say it with that huge caveat up front. I think there's a couple things you can do. I think one is every town, I mean, I don't know how racially diverse your town is. So I, I live in a fairly small town as well. Tacoma Park is, fairly small. And I think there are some people who live in what's called Old Town Tacoma, who probably have never had any experience of a negative police interaction. But Tacoma Park is, you know, it's fairly segregated in some ways. And different people have different relationships or experiences of policing. So, so I think that number one, if there are black and brown communities in your small town, I think it's important to be able to find a way to engage with them. And some of the best ways to engage with them may be to contact your local state or your local or your county NAACP chapter. If you have a local NAACP chapter and talk to them, because I think that's a great, they're, they're looking for more help. They're looking for more resources. They're looking for individuals who can contribute. And I think that they'd be able to share, you know, experiences of, um, from individuals who may have negative experiences with the police as well. Um, to the second part of your question about sort of getting additional information, I think it's important that police track how many stops they're engaging in and who is being stopped. I think that that's really sort of basic information that uh, all police departments should be tracking and should be available for public consumption. All right, I have a question from Professor Parikh. A recent student out of Chicago showed that Black and Latinx officers use less force in police interactions than white officers. To what extent should there be extensive efforts put at increasing Black leadership within law enforcement ranks and amongst line officers? Should this be a priority in reform, reform or funding conversations? So, so I think that that's, I mean, my personal opinion on that is that I think that that's really important but there are communities where the diversity has significantly increased. So I clerked for uh, Judge Damon J. Keith, who was in Detroit, and you know, he played a significant role in his rulings in getting uh, several, se several police departments as well as employers to change their hiring policies through significant decisions in Title VII cases. And while increasing diversity changes the bias equation a little bit. It hasn't led to a dramatic downturn in stops and arrests in predominantly African-American communities. And I think one of those, one of the reasons for that is, is that bias to the extent that that's the problem and not warrior training or calling on police to enforce laws that they shouldn't be enforcing or getting them involved in mental health crises, which are all things that they 
probably should not be doing. Bias affects all of us regardless of our race. I think several studies have shown that even if you are a person of color, uh, the media can still send you messages about who is or who is not a criminal. And so I think, I think my personal feeling is that increased diversity is important, but it doesn't get to the number one, the history of trauma, number two, policing and police enforcing laws that they shouldn't. And number three, I think even though, even if uh, a person themselves is not white per se, they can still be impacted by bias. I have a question from Adrian Johnson. Are police on board with sending mental health calls to other resources rather than police dispatch? What if you tell them that some, some police funding will go to those programs? So I, I, that, that is a great question. I, so I think that that's something that we're talking about you know, in Tacoma Park right now. It's something that we pushed for. And I think different officers are gonna have different feelings about it. I think based on my personal anecdotal experience, police are open to that. I think some of them have expressed concern about whether or not other individuals can safely handle individuals who are going through a mental health crisis and whether or not it will end up back in the police's hands anyway. But I found a significant degree of openness to that idea. A uh, question from Professor Plater. How do we address the fact that the police violence issue has become part of the Trump enhanced polarized split within our society as a whole? Yeah, that's that's really tough. Um, a couple of thoughts on that. I think first, it's definitely true. I agree with the professor because Policing involves deep and serious questions of race because of the history that we've talked about. And certainly I think the Trump enhanced polarized split, part of the fault lines of the Trump administration, um, at least you know, intentionally or unintentionally based on your perspective, um, dug at was racial fault lines in our in our country. I think that the way we address that and get over the Trump enhanced polarized split using the professor's language is to go back to the first point that I really started out with, the first principle when I'm sitting alone at night writing my papers or writing my briefs is that increased police violence makes all of us less safe means that individuals are not reaching out to the to police or state government officials in any sense for help. They don't trust the police and it makes it more likely that police will respond with violence because of the breakdown in that trust. So I, I think that the key is that reducing police violence not only is safer for black and brown communities that bear the disproportionate brunt of it, but it's safer for all communities involved. So we're basically at the at our end point, Ajmel. But perhaps the I noticed the last few questions to my mind are quite interesting and substantive. Uh, if you wanted to pick one of them, maybe and make that the final question, and then we can urge people to reach out to us through other uh, means to continue the conversation as you'll be with us for the next couple of days in one form or another. Do you think police, also I'll take this one, do you think police should be allowed to carry weapons when responding to nonviolent calls? It's quite scary to think that there'll be always a racist cop with a gun. And I think that goes to the crux of one of the things that I hope to get across today, which is why I'm picking it, is that ultimately it, it shouldn't be police's job to be responding to a nonviolent call. I think we need increased investment in, in social services that prevent the situations from arising that lead to the nonviolent calls. And then we need individuals whose entire job and entire training has been around providing social services and social work. So you don't have somebody who's going into that situation who really has only ancillary training on the issue. Thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of your questions. I hope that you got at least something out of the conversation today. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Ajmal. I really appreciate it. And as I said, people can reach out to you through the Rappaport Center, either by writing to me or to Lissy Medvedow or Cindy Wynn.
go to our website um, to see um, how to do that. Um, unfortunately, these Zoom events always have a drop off the edge of the cliff feeling as people leave the Zoom. And But I just want to say how much I've appreciated your talk and to uh, offer applause that I'm sure is echoed by everybody else. And we'll look forward to seeing you um, over the course of the next couple of days, particularly the students in the seminar. So thank you again. And thanks to all for joining us and for attending. And we'll all keep in touch. Thank you.